Hello everyone, today we talk about the 14th century Byzantine cavalrymen for our historical military units series. Uh, introducing a very interesting period that we also discussed in the basic videos about Byzantine history that is mainly a moment of recovery, in fact, of the same empire under the Palaiologoi dynasty um, after the, the recapture of Constantinople from, from the Latins that had held it since the Fourth Crusade. And that is, however, still a moment of important foreign influence as the same Palaiologoi, as you know, had risen to power thanks to important um, Western support, namely the Genoese, but in general and already since uh, the Comnena uh, era especially, you know, Western presence in the imperial territories had been quite strong and naturally this augmented after the Fourth Crusade, given that Latins had settled both in terms of you know, French feudal nobility in the Balkan interland, uh, the Italian maritime republics had taken over uh, the Aegean, etc. And so militarily wise, uh, in the development of the Palaiologoi armed forces, there is, from one side, um, a, say, typically traditional, if you want, Byzantine style of arms and armor, that at some point is not so easy to reconstruct, because um, we're not talking about overwhelmingly documented times uh, for different reasons that we'll explain now, but we, we have a lot of iconographic evidence that sometimes doesn't match with archaeology and or um, at least presents some kind of degree of um, stylistic idealism uh, that can be countered also by the same other iconographic sources and from the other, in fact, uh, an important amount of uh, foreign uh, influence, in fact, and so the hybrid that emerges from this is quite typically, uh, in fact, the, the true typically Byzantine character um, of this time. Naturally, we will talk about 14th century Byzantine cavalry as such from an organizational, tactical point of view. That is, in fact, regarding the army organization and tactics, uh, respectively, series. Uh, today is just the military units one, so we talk mostly about equipment, right? So, uh, just as a broader context, consider that the what we just said is is true about also the say the broader picture um, and of, of Byzantine cavalry altogether. Also, because you know that the Byzantine Empire at this point doesn't recover just as um first of all it doesn't recover all the lands it had lost, but some of them are taken over by local. Greek magnates and or, as we've seen, uh, still maintaining actually a foreign domination, a great deal of uh, influence. If you think, for example, I don't know, regions like Epirus in the westernmost um, Balkans, uh, well, these were surely more influenced by uh, Western style than, uh, than the Anatolian territories that would have been more kind of Turkic. Persian, Mongol influence by a certain degree, we will see it now. Um, but it's, uh, you know, speaking of cavalry as also um, a typically equestrian culture at this point, that you know Constantinople always owned because of the proximity of the steppes and also some, in fact, Central Asian, Middle Eastern uh, equestrian influence uh, is increased by the degree of privatization of the system. First of all, the Latins had imported feudalism in the empire. Great part of the uh, of what had remained of the um, centralized uh, statal uh, tradition of Constantinople had been lost together with state that collapsed, right, and caused this further fragmentation within the same recovered territories, eventually. And the pronoia had evolved further towards feudalism, and the same Byzantines settled. Uh, Western knights as, as vassals, as Akrita, etc. And this was typical again already in since the, the 12th century in, in very large numbers. Um, and all this brings to an increase of, of cavalry warfare, right? Considering that the wall region becomes a, a big frontier like the Balkans, Anatolia, um, 
in increase definitely the amount of mounted troops also among the, the, the lesser the lesser people. For example, many many Greeks began to when the system collapses, this is to be found in other areas, they, they turn into mercenaries fundamentally abroad. They many of them serve as literally Turkopoles that as we've seen has doesn't have a properly ethnic meaning anymore at this point, but it's just a type of um, fighting, it's a fighting style fundamentally, uh, and they serve, I don't know, in Cyprus, in other areas that also historically belonged to the broader Byzantine um, world, let's say, um, and there is also an important injection of, um, in fact, steps elements, right, if we think about the same rise of the Turks um, and all some other even northern influence from the Pontic steps, etc. We realized that uh, the the collapse of the state had brought to the, the flourishing of um, a certain even different types of lifestyle, right? You know, something more semi nomadic in certain areas. This is you know considered what had happened uh, at uh, central Anatolia when after Manzikert when the Turks and other peoples uh, basically break through. Right? There is literally a transformation of the local. Uh, politics and, and society uh, especially that brings mounted warfare also in the more generic kind of horse archery role and raiding warfare etc more typical right and this is true also for the Balkans that suffer an important degree of instability of which also other peoples profit um, and so there is um, definitely an increase of uh, that broader feudal slash uh, equestrian bias also in, in the Byzantine forces, from which naturally, especially the elite droves from from the west, right? Whereas the lesser troops are more influenced by the the steppes elements, by Turkic, Mongolian influence, even. Um, and there's a lot because the Mongols come that close, right, to to the empire, and uh, other peoples reversed, uh, you know, in, in in Europe also as a consequence. So. Uh, the Balkans especially are very, um, you know, involved, uh, very concerned by this uh, phenomenon. So, next to this, there is the typically Byzantine um, traditional attitude towards properly even the, the arts. You know, there is not even anything like a secular music, if it's Byzantine secular music, because if it is secular music, it's not Byzantine, right? Uh, there was just an official type of music, it was the ecclesiastical one, and all the rest, in fact, betrays also some kind of foreign influence. Same is said about art. Think about the icons, think about, in fact, the splendid figures of, um, of military uh, saints uh, that, uh, in fact, provide us with great part of the, also, the, the military iconographic uh, evidence of the time that, however, is very stylized, very ideal, right? It brings in always this kind of heavy classical um, style, right? And legacy that uh, is not just um, this point of Byzantine characteristic, but also, for example, a Russian one, right? When we look at uh, Russian iconography in the same period, we look essentially at, you know, Roman soldiers, right? Um, Roman Greek style soldiers from classical antiquity. When we look at actual archaeology, we see Mongol weapons and armor because that's what fundamentally Russia at this point had become, uh, as it was indistinguishable from uh, from 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 the Mongols uh, at that point. And I'm, I'm literally saying it was the thing, uh, and not just because, of course, the Russian aristocracy was you know, marrying to the, the Mongol one, etc., but literally because material culture had been massively influenced up to the Baltic by the Mongol one. But since they were, they were orthodox and also maintaining connections with Constantinople, importantly, that was the iconography, right? It was a heavily traditional um, and, in this sense, kind of unchanging, immutable um, a view uh, and style that this that is not really an advantage uh, in part more of that later so um, in spite of these archaisms that become say qualifying the Byzantine icon military iconography um, there is also however little doubt that uh, certain types of armor uh, had remained virtually unchanged uh, from prime important amount of time 
right? Even the tan sand, right? This this is essentially true. Uh, if you look even at I don't know a Carolingian horseman and uh, a thirteenth century Western knight. I mean, yes, there are important changes by some degree, but the essentials are the same, right? We're talking about a guy with a coat of mail, helmet, a lance, and a shield. There is essentially there are adjustments, differences, development, etc. The, the main one being plain armor spreading in a more consistent way, surely metallurgy evolving in that regard. Um, so we're talking about the 14th century today, yes, and in Western Europe, as you know, that there is a moment of important change, also of consolidation, if you want, of the elite um, dimension after, uh, surely especially from the second half of, of the 14th century, where in fact plate takes over fundamentally on, on mail um, to reach the apex in, in the following century. Um, the Byzantine world is relatively less armored for a couple of reasons that are naturally intertwined. The first one is that, um, and this is observable like in, say, in, in Eastern Europe, generally speaking, Southeastern Europe as well, the Balkans, um, as, a, uh, as an ethnic influence, I mean, fighting against lighter uh, enemies like the Mongols, the Turks, they were on average lighter, meaning, of course, they had ultra-heavy elite, uh, heavily armored um, troops, but uh, they were less uh, proportionally, right, and this fit simply, uh, as we were saying before, a different type of lifestyle, etc. Um, and so this this brings this to, to cope with them. It's like in later times, and you know, if you look at the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the early modern age, you know, they were basically identical to to um, to the Westerners at the beginning of the period in everything, uh, arms and armor, etc. When especially they consolidate their uh, eastern boundaries with with Lithuania, etc. You realize that in order to cope with the Tartars, with the Cossacks, etc., they had to start, you know, injecting an amount of troops of uh, that kind within them and or imitating that. And you know that Constantinople had always done the same thing with this avalanche of um, Eurasian, uh, Western Eurasian peoples that had always invested the empire. So they were they settled them in part, in part they imitated their their equipment. In part, they were the same people. In fact. Um, we've seen it many times in our Byzantine warfare playlist. Um, and so this made overall the uh, Byzantine fascists kind of lighter, right, on, the, on that ground. The other reason is that objectively these areas were less uh, advanced than others, right? Uh, Constantinople maintains basically um, the top military standards uh, together with the West for for an important amount of time, up to the 13th, right? By the 13th you realize that um, the same Western, let's say, the same Byzantine forces were heavily Westernizing, if anything, because the state was, uh, was, was, I mean, before the Fourth Crusade, I'm talking about, so the beginning of the century, was, were kind of taken over from the within as large bodies of mercenaries and or just properly a, a more effective um, military model, all right? And, and that costs a freaking lot, by the way, more than the kind of lighter troop. Of course, Constantinople had maintained its standards exactly because it was a statal reality and it could artificially but successfully replicate also this kind of steps or or western models um, depending on the situation so that it's they were that updated by the 12th century still got it right to the fullest but the state freaking collapses right so what the paleologoi start ruling from is just kind of a ramp of it if anything, yes, they control Constantinople, but they have much less resources. The same ones they control are infrastructurally devastated um, by upheavals, uh, wars, devastations, etc. And so they simply can't afford less, right? And um, in, in, in a sense, this also speaks for a, a greater difficulty in military updating. It's like saying, I don't know, uh, the, the, you know that the Orban, the Hungarian or German... Uh, artillery man that uh, before the siege of Constantinople offered um, uh, to Constantine the Eleventh uh, the the great bombard will eventually sell it to the Turks because the Byzantines simply didn't have money. But first of all, if they had nowhere to install that, because even placing it on the Theodosian walls would have made them crumble just because of the of the aftershock. Um, and you know how it ended. By the way, at that time, Constantinople would be defended also essentially by Western troops and or 
fully westernized type of uh, equipped troops, at least in the most effective side of the story. So you can see throughout the 14th and 15th century, the fact that that, you know, center of uh, updated military technology that Constantinople once was is, is in fact no more. Um, and this reflects likely also in the lighter, um, properly in the lighter equipment of even of kind of heavy uh, Byzantine cavalry. Today, today we talk about mostly heavy cavalry because the um, iconographic sources, especially in this very hieratic um, iconographic models, speak of, of the great heroes, right? Just um, so they are all heavy cavalrymen. And we see that they're not as heavy as others. Of course, there, there are archaisms uh, that do not take into account at some point, instead, the very heavy. Uh, equipment and also heavily westernized in this sense equipment but also there is interesting Turkic Mongol style of horse armor for example and similar things that that uh, an important part of bite of course still an elite of the the troops would would have uh, would have uh, used but um, we we don't see much lighter cavalry that instead was the normality Right, so we will just partially address the latter uh, later, and considering that it, it was also simpler for these um, for for these powers to hire not much just local subject, but again, as they had always done, this, this, there is a continuity in this foreign troops that had simply spent their entire life on horseback, right, coming from God knows where, as opposed to still, I don't know, a Greek, uh, a, a Bulgarian, uh, and so we, we, we were mostly agriculturers, right? But yes, they could be into raiding warfare themselves by, by a certain degree. Um, so there is not much changing from even the previous centers in terms of armor. The, the, the older styles predominate apparently amongst the Byzantines even at this late date, right? And th the reason why you think so is that in order to make a counter argument, there should be any evidence of the contrary. Well, uh, there is not, right? You know, the iconography speaks entirely the same old archaic language, and therefore we can barely see uh, any other form of, of evidence. There is, uh, in this sense, interpreting the Byzantine art some cons consideration regarding the, uh, the paintings of soldiers, especially surviving from the 14th to 15th centuries, that are religious rather than secular, um, uh, in fact, uh, art, right? So they, they mostly portray military saints such as the famed Saint George, Saint Demetrius, um, and, and so where they are non-religious, they tend to be of historical personages or events as well. So it's possible that some deliberate attempt may have been made by the artists to introduce further classical elements. Uh, and yet, and that's what confirmed actually the idea of an archaic Byzantine military style actually to be found on the battlefields, is that the armor depicted in the sources um, is alongside contemporary civilian dress as well. So there is uh, a touch of realism and historical updating and accuracy regarding current times, in fact, that makes us think that those were literally 14th, 15th century armor uh, and, and weapons. So actually being very old fashioned by, by that time. Uh, even as late as the mid 15th century, for example, there is a paint in the Brontokeion Monastery in Mistras, possibly depicting the Saint Constantine the Eleventh, um, representing such old uh, dated armor, complete with pteruges, so you know the, the, the strip like defenses for the upper parts of limbs attached to, to the armor, right? The, the typical classical antiquity. Uh, and breast bands. Uh, and the Byzantines continued to use such obsol uh, obsolescent uh, 
equipment demonstrating perhaps some sort in fact of what we were depicting before like in terms of a general backwardness and or perhaps lack of resources to to update their their gear because it would have costed too much and given again that it was uh, a lighter uh, cavalry bias in the Byzantine forces that may have even just not been a, a particular problem or even um, say a proof of a of an alleged military decline altogether again uh, Constantinople at this point was still a power among powers um, surely much reduced compared to its previous uh, heyday of just you know a couple of centuries before um, but um, you know there were many troops uh, especially in the eastern Mediterranean would fight uh, more like lice as light troops right as lighter troops and so even the same Byzantines adding a bit perhaps of artistic license in their iconography were just mediating between kind of fantasy and reality to, to an acceptable degree except we lack uh, other terms of comparison coming from the, within the same Byzantine art. Uh, so we can think of different types of troops. We will hear as we often do for the historical military unit series kind of stereotype um, and combining certain certain armor types and elements that you know seem realistic. Um, so a typical armor flourishing between the last decade of the 13th century and the early 14th um, differs from the more usual Byzantine style mainly for the addition of a sort of waistcoat buttoned down the front and an upstanding collar right cavern neck upper torso protection of small rectangular lamina which may indicate that some sort of coat of plates was worn beneath what looks like and unfortunately we don't know because it's mostly uh, iconographic sources letter um, corselet concealed by the waistcoat um, and um, there is in fact some wall paintings um, in the Kariya um, Kami in Constantinople uh, dating from this the same exact period showing um, let's say um, this kind of in fact more conventional cuirass to which a col this color is added, right? And there is the, the point about it is that there, it doesn't seem to have been nor traditional nor specifically connected to, um, to, to a specific foreign influence. I can't think of colors that were kind of plate colors, something very bulky like in, in Serbian or Italian military art. Um, but this looks mostly like um, a kind of newly developed Southeast European armor, which is quite quite interesting. But speaking of the aforementioned waistcoat, uh, this must have been kilted, right? Speaking of properly of composition, because otherwise it's difficult to understand uh, its importance. But you know that um, padded kilted armor is um, is really common throughout all the era pretty much everywhere and we think in this sense it was identical to, to that found in in the Western European sources at the same time. Um, for example we have um, a list of Byzantine arms dating to 1326 that specifically speaks of the same uh, French French um, derived words pourpoint and gambeson uh, to describe locally used corselets. Right so this would have been normal by a certain degree, naturally, with, with other styles in, I don't know, in, in the Near East, in fact, in the same uh, Byzantine-controlled uh, Asia, at least for a while, um, that uh, also for climatic reasons, frankly, were, were, were important because this material also isolates um, a lot and sometimes wearing properly metal armor, even in addition to that, under I don't know the Syrian sun becomes you know in summer prohibited but by by a certain degree and the same happens in Europe believe me uh, as well um, so there were also more 
typical types of soldiers we could um, we could describe uh, dating from the sources for example to the mid 14th century there is a, a fresco for example depicting Saint Demetrius wearing um, a hip length male, male corselet right um, and the saint is also wearing an officer's sash tied around his chest making him in fact the prototype of a heavy cavalryman armed with lance shield and um, we can add from for example a Thessalonian um, manuscript of the same date saber and bow right uh, the aforementioned privatization of the same Greek nobility at this point um, the constant exposure to different types of enemies coming say from uh, like Mongols, Westerners, etc., um, would also increase in in some way something that had been already part of, of the Byzantine elite training, that is, specializing with every single type of weapon, right? You can think, of course, also of a Western knight at this point uh, being able to use every single kind of weapon, but starting from the 14th and 15th century, there is a hyper specialization of heavy cavalry towards that kind of um, ultra heavy shock charge and for which there are also other in fact lighter types that develop next to it whereas before that was you know that sum of uh, you know capacities was kind of condensating the same guy well in in the Byzantine world this this multi functionality this this greater amount of skills probably from an individual point of view albeit at the expense of the collective training that required resources that imperial army at least to the extent and before didn't have anymore was instead perhaps more more the norm right it, it's it's a wilder area that becoming really uh, uh, in Europe and importantly influence again of this much wilder actually elements coming especially from the Turkic Mongolian world Right, but not only because we will see, for example, the Westerners yes did bring an important amount of heavy cavalry, you know, crossbow bo uh, warfare, etc. But think about the Catalan company about which we also made a couple of videos at this time, serving the empire and also mutinying and ravaging it in, in the meanwhile. By the way, I mean it, it brings in some of the some of the most different types of um, of fighters. Uh, in, in this in this region, right, to confront aid with each other, and the local nobility had to cope with, with all of them, right. So that's a, a very important aspect uh, of the story. So the heavily armored, um, uh, or at least the heavy cavalryman in the first place, that is also skilled in horse archery, or something that um, the westerns begin to forget a little bit, in spite they do hunt on horseback but not with the same degree of technicality that um, say is required now on the battlefields because they're factually gentrifying by by a certain degree they're civilizing themselves instead these ones ha are in, still in the eye of the storm and they have to adapt quickly to, to the circumstances at some point effectively because the Empire still is able to strike back as a matter of fact at some level, just mostly in order to survive, right? In fact, uh, prolonging its existence up to the mid 15th century, as we know, but still with with, with enormous effort. Um, speaking of bows, for example, the history of Alexander, a Byzantine or Armenian manuscript from within the the Byzantine world, we'll come back to it. It's dating um, to the early mid 14th century, depicts short Asiatic composites interestingly enough even though it depicts also kind of Achaemenid troops versus Alexander so one may think that there is some ethnic divide even trying to mirror kind of the, the western hero and the, the eastern hordes that were instead of course something very different in practice and still at this time uh, in fact the, the we, we find interesting um, bow cases styles some are non Asiatic. Um, and uh, the, for example, the, the, reason, the, the, the main Western type is, is virtually the same one all over the Byzantine 
and the Serbian pictures of the period. You know that this other areas, Macedonia, Bulgaria, you know, others also, you know, so were heavily influenced. In fact, just like the history of Alexander, we can't really tell where it came from. So sometimes we can't even uh, exchange them in part. However, um, at the same time, we find, um, you know, also, and we presumably think they were quite normal among the many foreign mercenaries of Constantinople, um, Persian, um, Asiatic varieties. The aforementioned history of Alexander, for example, um, show um, the long box-like stamp cavalry type, even the smaller Middle Eastern Mamluk form appearing. So uh, these also are associated to the um, uh, to the Achaemenids in the in the work. So it, it's interesting to observe um, even Turkish style double-breasted coats um, and such things. So we we always uh, see a, a mixed um, assortment of uh, of equipment. But just knowing that there were different uh, different customs of where, for example the quiver, at least in Byzantine armies, mostly hang on, on the right, or at least it's represented as such. There were different traditions uh, regarding this. But anyhow, um, speaking of shields, we find also a, a very frequently depicted one in Byzantine art that uh, is not the, um, the typically almond-shaped like that um, the Imperial Army had um, had been used, in fact, for, for a long time, that actually disappears exactly at, at this time. And this typology seems to have been connected with the German mercenaries in the Byzantine Army, the Alamannicon, because uh, similar forms are to be found uh, in, in Central Europe, in the, in the Germanic areas uh, at this point. And since there were many German mercenary knights in Constantinople, some have made uh, this association. Fundamentally, it's a long, straight-sided, triangular uh, uh, shield, right? It's not even dramatically different from the almond-shaped one in terms of dimension. Mostly it was like 45 centimeters wide, but varying in height, for example, between 90 to 150 centimeters. It, it also appears to be very light in construction, frankly, and this generally speaking points, um, considering the, the lightening and the narrowing uh, at the end of the day of, of the surface, uh, a similar process to the one we see in the West with this uh, kind of the shrinking of the shield because of the spread of heavy armor, but because of the, the difference uh, that we were speaking before um, in, uh, in, in the Byzantine lands, we think that um, this kind of uh, larger type um, remains uh, more popular because of the, in part, the lighter equipment of the Imperial forces but also the, the much greater amount of, um, of arrows in, in, in the east was still rendering necessary kind of an extensive uh, protection. Like an average westerner at this point going at the Crusades, they continued. Like there is the one against Smyrnae, um, against the Turks, so that you find westerners going uh, at war, adapting their tactics also to Turkish archery. There are very interesting treatises about that in, in, in this period, but still heavily armored by the, in fact, very heavy standards that the West was, was reaching uh, at this point, even in, uh, for, for the average trooper. Well, in Constantinople, it was perhaps um, different in this regard. And, um, and uh, yeah, the, it's a, a simply a flat-topped, curved, and pointed kite-shaped shield. Um, becoming a characteristic feature of, uh, of the, the Byzantine warrior's art. And naturally considered the 
broader functionality of the shield that is still conceived, especially for cavalry, this kind of, you know, rectangular protection for, for your side, of course, could be, um, you know, uh, also slung behind the back by its gauge strap, when especially the bow was in use in this in this context, but, you know, you could use it as you want, but in, in, a, in a more, you know, practical and usual fashion would have been just kept also on, on the side during the charge and protecting the legs, right? The reason why it's so long is that it goes down to the legs. And as you know, at this point, the Western shield instead is somewhat habitually smaller um, as also legs are ever better protected with plate armor, uh, etc. So this may be yet another indication that um, normally a Byzantine horsemen invested had enough um, wealth on average to invest more in the head and the chest, but you know, consistently less maybe with the legs compared to a Westerner. This is just speculation. Again, some Byzantine horsemen were ultra heavily protected as well as a Western uh, knight, also because they would buy at uh, some point the, the entire panoplies, but there are these kind of things, I don't know, there are the Romanian knights in, in the 15th century that have uh, plate, full plate uh, Milanese armor, except, you know, they, they they didn't buy anything from, from the waist down because they didn't have enough money. That That's quite interesting if you think about that. Um, also the spores worn, for example, um, basing ourselves on several Thessalonican depictions of St. Demetrius indicate Western influence as well. Um, but going back to the aforementioned romance of Alexander the Great that provides with um, an incredible amount of information on especially the heavier type of cavalry. Well, um, we realized considering it dates to the 60s of, of the 14th century, around 1360, let's say, um, can't see interestingly composite um, armor, for example. The male corselet uh, with leather fringes at shoulder and waist plus leather breast band and shoulder reinforcements. Plus, in the same guy, scalar male shows. Um, some say an indication of Frankish influence, yes, probably especially as the, the shows are concerned, this shows cover the feet too and could be worn with or without boots. In the same source, instead, and this is the, the reverse, um, similar armor for the forearms is not in evidence, right? There are other um, sources actually depicting importantly, you know, heavily armored torso, such as long-sleeved male shirt, right, also Western influence. Here it's it's the contrary. Anyway. It, it's a, you know, quite stylized uh, source, so even here we, we don't understand exactly whether, you know, maybe the, the shows are just uh, the legs below the one of the least evident armor part, while it's rather the, the torso to be more showing this uh, archaism next to still some male, as we've just seen. Um, and this latter source is, however, typically as heavy as it could get during the 14th century, right? Um, there are, uh, in the same manuscript, uh, some, for example, scale hoods covering the entire face, except for the eyes. Consider there is lamellar armor around the same horse armor is lamellar in some of these sources. So uh, it's not just too lighter, but still um, this, this combination is a lighter in, in absolute terms than what Western armor was getting at this time, and undoubtedly the latter type of comprehensive armor would have been available only to 
soldiers of elite guard units right there is an example of the lighter type of horsemen from the aforementioned Kariye Khan in Constantinople um, that depicts Tiro right uh, wearing a small male shirt under his tunic right um, the name means record in, uh, in in Latin as you know and so this could represent in these paintings a newly recruited soldier may indicate a youthful uh, in this case it's even an infantryman on a cavalry mode but you know they could easily be exchanged especially in this kind of lighter roles but not only um, say Jesse was more likely for a lighter trooper to be also mounted in this context than uh, than a heavier guy, right? You know, remember the the greater equestrian bias also among the the lighter troops, and in fact, such soldiers played a significant role in in the same defense of of the Byzantine Empire as um, uh, the frontiers were quickly shrinking. So fighting an essentially guerrilla war raid and ambush in mountainous ra regions like in the Balkans, in Anatolia we can think of Bithynia. This is historically, you know, kind of very, uh, in fact, wilder areas, mountainous ones, etc. And very like uh, the the Turks later on. I mean, the, the Ottomans race fundamentally within a Western context, right? This one specifically. And speaking of head protection, uh, an average Byzantine cavalryman would wear a coif of um, kilted fabric or leather. Some would use mail, too, of course. We find, however, also the brimmed chapelle de fer, um, normally with a male aventail, like the one we uh, mentioned before for the history uh, of Alexander. Also, some kind of laminated or lamellar neck defense, as we were documented uh, before. That again, when arrows are around, whether it's ho from horse archery or, you know, a foot crossbow, and it's better to be preserved from. And again, it's not a surprise that this kind of southern, southeastern European region, broadly speaking, witnesses that uh, an important level, but not all, in, also in central. Um, the rest of Eastern Europe agrees still some of that because of still of the importance that some mounted archery has preserves uh, all around. Um, there were some peoples that lived like uh, at the bottom end of the you know corridor of of the steps. Peoples that arrived from through through the Danube, pick the Serbians, for example. That you know in that sense would have had to do. Where the Byzantines were pretty much the same in this regard. Uh, there are also conical helmets with decorative attachments on the front, which uh, are incidentally and strikingly similar to helmets shown in very late 13th and early 14th century Spanish art. And if you consider the aforementioned uh, exploit of the Catalan Grand Company, um, the state that the, the latter formed in Greece, right, and the the broader impact that this had on on the region, generally speaking, could be uh, a good uh, causal connection. There is yet a f uh, another form of helmet uh, that um, we will comment when talking about Balkan warfare more broadly. It's essentially a rounded, often tall. And um, usually um, it has a decorative finial as well, um, appearing to extend far down the wearer's back, right? Um, and uh, some say that there may be some Islamic or Russian origin to that. In fact, there are some uh, helmets preserved in Russia that um, display this characteristic, but also seem to have been um, Byzantine gifts of the same time because there are unequivocally uh, Byzantine decorations on that. I mean, that I mean are not even the the, the still the Russian kind of Orthodox uh, style type, and so we just know this form 
was around in, in, in a way or in another. Speaking of shields, as we were saying before, there, th there is this main triangular type, uh, the almond shape one tends to disappear, um, but there are also circular types still and especially for the heavier cavalry that would have needed less protection uh, as we were saying for the, the shield would have been smaller like like in the west and the circular type that you don't find in the west is perhaps to be say more uh, extensively um, superficial to, as to, to, to block more more projectiles and this would be more typical kind of, uh, in fact, mounted warfare where you couldn't form a shield wall. At that point, would have rather been with a rectangular shield of some sort, if it as some types that existed. In fact, even for cavalry, telling the truth, in Central Europe, the Balkans, even in Eastern Europe, they were probably designed in the same way to stop arrow fiber. Again, for a fully armored um, horseman, that was not much of a problem. Just more for fancy kind of pairing. Um, you know, fending, punching uh, with the umba and so on. And um, the similar circular shapes are, in fact, more typical of this broader Eastern European and kind of Near Eastern, Middle Eastern, even Central Asian area, right? Uh, speaking of colors, we know that some, for example, guard units were uniformed, right? Uh, the shields could be painted with some solid color, m most often red, right? Uh, red and white or blue and white stripes or chevrons too, being seemingly common in the Byzantine Empire with the various, uh, some big um, chunks of it that can be considered already as successor state by, by a certain degree. Um, we know that from the pseudo codinus that the Vardariots wore, so properly the, the Imperial Guards wore red, um, the so-called Sacones sky blue, uh, embroidered on breast and back with two, uh, two white lions face to face. Also Nicephorus Gregoras mentions uniforms in the mid 14th century. Um, in the 16th, it's late, but let's say the Ottoman historian Bitlisi mentions that um, the Byzantine soldiers customarily, uh, customarily wore scarlet, which may be uh, like, you know, red normally it's for hiding blood. The Spartans, the Romans preferred it, albeit there were plenty of other colors everywhere, including this era. But also the connection with the purple, you know, it's kind of more red, purple colors, but probably common specifically in, in the Byzantine army. Speaking of basic cavalry arms um, we find in the manuscripts uh, and in the other iconographic sources lances swords sabers and in several miniatures we see officers carrying a mace which may be like maybe yet another anachronism but perhaps not so much because the mace was coming back also with this kind of more Eastern influence warfare where, as you know, in, especially in the steppes, the mace is, is, um, is a long last, longer lasting symbol of, of command. And it had a specifically, you know, a specifically opological and also symbolical meaning because of the initiatic um, right of, of the lightly armored, ideally, right? Uh, striking just with a mace, the, the coming close, coming closing to the heavily armor, right? But still, again, wherever you find mace, you find armor, and so uh, maces uh, are appearing uh, ever more in Europe because of the spread of plate armor, so it's perfectly normal by a degree. And we find, however, in weapons, a striking foreign influence. First of all, there are different types. Some are straight tapering ones that are kind of more typical of the we see even daggers some sort of other weapons that were spreading um in in the west especially among the lighter cavalry to just you know uh, stick them in, in the in the mail in the at least in the uh, 
uh, space, the gap between plates are of, uh, at, at close in close combat, very physical, one uh, close uh, distance, almost wrestling like or of Hanor's knight for against Hanor's knights and so on. Others instead are curved sabers, most could say Central Asian influence. Um, the uh, swords depicted in the Karia Kami in Constantinople look purely Western European and indeed rather Italian, which considering the material wealth and the technological advancement of Italy that had the most advanced, in fact, armory industry uh, at the time and, uh, and the, the Italian, the, the Venetian Genoese presence in the Aegean and the same Byzantine army is nothing surprising, uh, telling the truth. In, in the same source we find that kind of short swords or daggers that sent Procopius um, that is held in a seat pulled up tightly almost under his left armpit, so it's kind of properly a side weapon to extract in the moment of greater trouble. Other swords about the minority are of Turkic Iranian influence. Um, so yeah, this is the picture and it's exactly what you would expect. Naturally today we drew some broader stereotypes also based on the on the available evidence that I also couldn't post entirely here because of copyright issues. But there is enough to, to watch, frankly, and um, and it's very um, very interesting. As you see, uh, so the, this the, the Byzantine panoply could be very, very composed, customized, personalized, uh, not differently from from the Western one, but let's say um, in a way of of course in which you know the the Byzantine area had become a a crossroad of, of important and fundamentally rising military cultures, right? Um, we see again Western influence, Mongolian influence, Persian influence, Egyptian influence. Even don't underestimate this, uh, the the Mamluk Sultanate that at this point was heavily informing even the same Turkish, Turkic if you prefer armies. Right, the Ottomans were born within essentially the Byzantine Empire and uh, in a region dramatically influenced also by the same Mamluks. Um, and um, the archaisms are also probably of relative, um, of relative um, importance, meaning that uh, still armor works, right? You don't need to have the single most updated stuff. I mean, how much do you want armor to have actually differed um, across the centuries? Um, in spite of surely the improvement that existed, but one point that is usually not made about armor is how, you know, resistant it could be, how, how long could it be used, and what different qualities existed, right? And modern replicas and testing also I don't think are really very, um, very useful because they don't necessarily look at the, um, at in fact at the extremely composite set of uh, uh, of defense that that they were part of in a sense, and, and to the, the ways that a person that is risking their lives is is using uh, properly. Right. This is not just wearing a helmet because you have to drive a motorcycle in in a 21st century urban environment. They, there you have literally to, to receive dramatically heavy blows that will crush still your bones, even probably causing um, uh, you know internal internal hemorrhages in your body and, and more. Um, and with with extraordinary forces, like normally cavalry charges at 45 kilometers per hour. You, you wouldn't have the guts of charging at that speed against a formation of, of of other horsemen charging in the same way today. You you need something that you just don't. And so if you don't have that mentally, how can you even know how your you know your you would adapt um your your arms and armor if you if you if you had one.
right? You, you cannot know that. That's the limit that reconstructionism has to sculpt in their skulls because without this, there can't be any scientifically and morally positive value to any form of reconstruction, right? So as always, the most important thing is, is looking at the sources and realizing how much also we don't know by, by a certain degree, which is totally normal, right? And actually, for the late Middle Ages, we start finding more more evidence and more reliable one archaeological. But you know, even for the 13th, where it's not that we know that much, telling the truth in practical terms. And so, I'm glad that today we managed to cover this topic, uh, Byzantine warfare. As you know, I have several playlists documenting documenting it. That was a general one, and then various sub. Uh, once, if you are interested in more specific eras, details, etc. However, for today, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.